Hi there, and welcome to episode 23 of the Sage Running Podcast. We're back. This is kind of a new, hopefully upgraded series, uh, better audio quality, better content, more regular content for you running fans out there. And just want to do a big shout out to the Patreon supporters for really making this possible, as well as all of you listening. Be sure to subscribe on here for more episodes. But in today's episode, we're going to talk about periodization in your running training and kind of how your training changes over time with key workouts so you could peak at the right time for your focus race and get in the best shape of your life. Let's get started. Oh man, it's been a while. Welcome back. Uh, I've been meaning to get more into podcasting and thanks to the Patreon supporters, able to upgrade with this new audio gear we actually have a multi-mic setup so hopefully the audio experience is better for you guys uh getting more streamlined with the process i'm still new to this so bear with me and right now they're doing construction down on the street below our apartment so i hope there's not too much background noise but i'll try to edit that out in, in post but anyway hope your running's going well thank you for tuning in this is episode 23. I think uh, we'll just start counting up from this number here. You could find us on iTunes as well as on the website, sagerunning.com. I'll post blog posts linking to uh, these audio files and kind of give a brief summary of what this podcast is about. But this one will be a first one. We'll have guests on later uh, with the dual mic setup as well as Coach Sandy and uh, talk about different subjects, interview different people, whatever you guys like to hear about. In this one, we're going to touch on periodization in training, and this will be applicable if you're a 5K, 10K road runner, track runner, or you're training for a 100-mile mountain ultra, anything in between. You know me, any surface, any distance. We're also going to have this up on YouTube with the video, and hopefully the audio syncs. But I'll get into uh, this talk, and I've, I've done talks on YouTube with the Training Talk series on periodization or how your ch- training changes over time. But this is kind of going to, I'll get into some real big detail here. Uh, This podcast won't be as long as maybe some of the other interviews we'll do in the future. Uh, Looking for that 30 to 40 minute length, maybe a little bit longer. But this one will be on the shorter side. But uh, we'll just dig in here and, and get started. So. The real question is a lot of athletes ask, you know, what is periodization? What is your, your seven day training cycle or, or what do you, what are, what workouts do I need to do to get, uh, to my best potential in X race, whether it's a, a marathon or it's a 50 mile ultra marathon, 80 K mountain race, hundred K hundred miles. And, you know, that's a tricky question. It's a tricky loaded question because what it comes down to really is, your background in running, uh, what you've done over the past months or years, or your whole lifetime, basically your lifetime aerobic base, so to speak, but also the specific demands of, of what event you're training for, how long the distance is, how long of a duration it's going to be for you, uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are as a runner in terms of, of your natural born gifts, you know, your muscle fiber type, we have slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers, uh, and how you know, things in your life, life stresses have changed your fitness level and your overall health over time. So pretty loaded question, a lot of complex variables there. But the real key is is to say, okay, I have this many weeks before my key race. And hopefully it's a number of weeks if you want to get in really good shape. It might even be years in advance, right? Periodization, we're talking about our training structure and racing structure over time. And it could be years. Uh, people training for the Olympics have a, a goal every four years to try to peak for the Olympic trials or the Olympics, uh, make that team. And it only happens once every four years. So they're, they're already planning out. When I ran professional road marathons uh, in the group I was training for, we only could run, the coaches made us only run three marathons every two years, right? So you, maybe you do a fall marathon then you do a spring marathon, but then the next year you got to do a half marathon in the spring and then maybe you get one more major marathon in the fall and you're only you're only peaking for a key marathon race once or twice a year and that's your goal focus and you put all your marbles in that one basket which is a good way to do it a lot of pros will do it that way that being said a lot of people like to race more frequently than than that myself included and we're not always just trying to ultimately make the olympic team we're just trying to get the best out of ourselves we're trying to run a personal best we're trying to qualify for the boston marathon or to just you know be healthy in general but we want to do well in our key events that we're focusing for and if we find out we get into a 
Western states or we get into the UTMB lottery or Hard Rock or something like that, we want to peak and do really, really well at this big dream race of ours. And so that's when periodization comes into play. And you see it a lot in our Sage Running. We sell training plans, Coach Sandy and I, on our website, sagerunning.com. Our training plans are usually 12 to 16 week blocks of focus training for a key event, whether it's a half marathon or 100 mile ultra marathon. And we usually recommend you've, you've done some running even before that, some light, easy paced running, so to speak, aerobic base building to just get your mileage up. Uh, so you're not going from zero to 40 miles a week or zero to, to 60K a week, right? Right off the bat, that's an injury risk. So you want to slowly build your mileage up easy pace running then we launch into the actual plan which has structured workouts for 12 weeks or 16 weeks at a time and they're usually structured into blocks of training where there's four to six week maybe it's eight week block where you're focusing on a certain system or you're focusing on developing a certain aspect of of triggering body adaptations basically uh, and then it's changing a focus, changing workout focus and uh, stimulus and stress, so to speak, in the next four to eight week block. And then you have maybe a two week taper block. So the whole idea with periodization is looking at your training, maybe on a weekly basis. And we do operate on seven day cycles a lot because most people, a lot of people, a lot of you work uh, Monday through Friday, and then you have the weekend off or something like that. But in my own training, sometimes you see more of a 10 day cycle or a 12 day cycle. But at the same time, it's not always the same repeating cycle. I think a lot of people are, are caught up into the idea that you have to do the same seven-day cycle over and over, and you're doing it all year. And famous runners like Frank Shorter used to always have that seven-day cycle, right? It was the, the weekend long run, right, and Saturday or Sunday when you probably don't have to work as much or maybe you don't have as many family obligations or maybe you have more family obligations, I should say. Uh, whenever, whatever day of the week you have the most free time, you put in your big long run. And for Frank Shorter, it was running two hours only, but he'd cover 20 miles or 32K training for a marathon. So pretty fast long run there. Uh, but maybe you're going out on the trails for three or four hours and you're putting in a big long run. If you're training for, for an ultra or something like that, maybe you get a whole day to explore in the, the mountains or, or something like that. So you're putting in this big mileage block on the weekends or on, on your day off from work. And, and it's this long run focus, but the idea that you would do the same 20 mile long run every single week, uh, is not ideal. Uh, it's, it's a good practice to do a long run regularly like that, but maybe one week you, you do a 16 miler and it's more flat and fast. And then the next week you do a, a 20 or 22 miler, or what is that? 35 K long run, but it's, it's hilly and it's really demanding and it takes almost twice as long, something like that. So you're changing the long run stimulus, even though you're doing a long run every weekend, you're changing the stimulus and maybe maybe even you skip a weekend and the one weekend there isn't a long run, there's a speed work session or something like that. So it's not a concise seven day cycle where it's always the same. Mostly there it's the same because you're doing some sort of long run stimulus or long run on the weekend, but the nature of the long run changes and the details of how that long run is structured changes. And in our sage running.com training plans, and this is a business plug, you will see that a lot of key long runs are key workouts where there's inner there's speed mixed in, right? With a fartlek timed fartlek with with uh, periods of time, three to five minute surges, where you're changing the pace up, or you're you're running a, a big negative split, maybe in the last ten miles or the last sixteen kilometers, you're speeding up faster around marathon pace on a flat road or something like that. So you're throwing down these harder efforts at the end of long runs, negative splitting them, changing up the pace. But then other weekends, you're you're just going out and having fun and exploring and spending time on your feet, practicing power hiking, taking it real chill and easy, but focusing in on getting in the distance and the duration and the vertical and uh, numbers like that. So that's just one short example kind of of how periodization comes into play. Now we start talking about the, the weekly structure, right? The seven day structure and or 10 day structure, but usually we're going with the seven day structure. And if we go back to the the Frank Shorter example, or guys that were really kicking butt back in the, the 70s and 80s, and while well, they were kicking butt in the 60s too, let's be real. The, they're doing some speed work, maybe. Uh, and you know, Frank Shorter training for Olympic marathon, uh, he got gold in the marathon. He's just one example, but maybe they're doing speed work on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? You got a long run Saturday or Sunday, 
in between you got some easy days and these guys are running seven days a week maybe six days a week and they take one day off but you got some sort of structured shorter interval speed work let's say it's a track session let's say you do 10 by 800 meters on on a tuesday and you're doing this at at 5k pace type of work kind of a, a vo2 max with a short two minute rest right uh so that's tuesday but you don't do that every Tuesday. You don't always do the 10 by 800. Maybe the next week you do uh, 5 by 1600 or 5 by 1 mile. Uh, and it's it's a slightly slower pace. Maybe it's closer to 10K pace. But the stimulus the stimulus is still relatively the same. It's a matter of, of extension, right? You start doing longer intervals. You could spend more time at your VO2 max or working at a pretty high heart rate say over 90% maximum heart rate, and you're really hanging out there when you're doing mile repeats or you're doing 1600 meter repeats, and it's a demanding workout. But then the next week after that, maybe maybe you do 400 meter repeats. So you, you, did, you did 800 meter repeats one week, one Tuesday. Then the next Tuesday, you bumped it up to, to five by 1600 meter repeats. But then the next week after that, you're down to 12 by 400, and uh, you do these even faster than 5K pace, but it's it's designed as not a super hard workout. The mile repeats really drained you one week, but then the next week you say, okay, I'm going to step back and I'm going to do something a little bit more moderate. I'm going to do these 400 meter repeats, which could be really, really hard if you do them fast with a short rest. But let's say you, you keep the two minute rest and you do these at about a little faster than 5K pace, maybe projected 3K race pace, if you know what that is. And uh, it's more of a leg turnover workout, running economy, we call it. So it's working on form and efficiency at a faster pace, getting the heart rate spiking a little, but not developing too much lactic acid, not hanging out there at VO2 max, or, or really, really pushing hard to the well. Maybe it's a 7 out of 10 on the pain scale, right? But the focus is on getting the legs to shift gears and to go even faster. And you have some residual fatigue you still have this fatigue from doing all these other hard workouts. Maybe the mile repeats made you tired for a couple of days, right? And uh, the long run on the weekend, maybe you had a 20-mile long run or a 32K long run on the weekend. So you're tired from that. And you have to look back, you know, what did I do last week? What did I do two weeks ago? What's my, my weekly mileage total for this week? But also, what was it last week? What is my weekly mileage total for the last seven days, Right? If you're on a Tuesday and all of a sudden you count back seven days, you might have a different seven-day mileage total, how many kilometers you ran in that past seven days, than you did when you totaled up, when Strava totaled up your, your total at the end of the week on a Sunday. Right, uh, So how you count your, your weekly mileage is always changing, and that stress is always changing, and it kind of ebbs and flows, and it ties into other things in your life. So with our structure, with our sage running training plans, uh, we have a structure and we give you workouts and they're progressive in nature. So it's period is periodized. I can barely say the word now. And the idea is that you follow it kind of to a T, but life throws you curve balls. Uh, maybe you have to travel. Maybe your kid gets a cold and then you get a cold and you're sick and you have to take some days off and then You've got this track workout and you, you can't breathe as well, so you have to dial it back or you have to skip a workout here and there or you have to make some adjustments on the fly. And that's okay. That's okay. That's part of training. And ideal training is you have a coach in there in person looking over your shoulder every workout and they're critiquing your form and they go to the track with you and they have the stopwatch out there and they say, hey, you're looking a little rough. You need to hold back on this this rep or you need to cut this workout short maybe a little or hey, you're feeling good, you're, you're crushing this workout, maybe we'll end with some fast 200-meter strides or some 200 meters to repeats to work on your kick or something like that. So they're constantly trying to adjust the training plan and indiv- making it individual, uh, individualized training plan for you. And that you know that's the ideal, but we realize that most people don't have, the, the, maybe they can't afford a coach or you don't have a coach, especially in person, a coach in person watching every single workout. So the next best thing is to have communication, of course, with a coach and feedback after every workout. But then not everyone could afford that either. So the next best thing is to have a template or at least a plan or some sort of uh, guide so that you know how to structure these key workouts. And that's kind of why we came out with the plans. But 
uh, the idea is that you're empowered enough to be able to coach yourself and, and to make some of these calls on your own. And uh, that's really the goal. If you listen to these podcasts and, and watch uh, the YouTube videos and uh, see some of the different training talks, hopefully you know, read up on different books, you know, Jack Daniels distance running formula, obviously a big influence for me as well as Pete Fitzinger's advanced marathon running. Uh, Sandy and I co-authored a book, say the sage running secret, a guide to speedy ultras and, if you could combine uh, some of these these points together and, and to, to put things into perspective, you could empower yourself to be able to follow a training plan, make adjustments as necessary, uh, but kind of see the patterns of why these key workouts kind of flow together. And going back to that uh, seven-day week cycle, going back to doing a long run on a weekend, then a short, uh, faster track session maybe on Tuesday, but then maybe let's say on, on Thursday – but maybe it's Friday, maybe you take an easy day Wednesday, you take a day off, uh, you have a, a lactate threshold session or a tempo run session or something longer to work more on stamina. In, in ultra running, this would still be considered speed work because it's faster than race pace, but in, in uh, half marathon training and marathon training, it's more considered steady state work, uh, tempo run. So maybe you have a, maybe it's an easier week and you just have a 20-minute tempo run at 80 85% maximum heart rate or... 20 minutes flat out. Uh, maybe it's an, a hill workout, though. Maybe you're running uphill on a treadmill at 10% grade, or you're running up a mountain, something like that, for 20 or 30 minutes at a moderate effort, but not a killer effort. And the idea is to be to work on your stamina, uh, high end aerobic fitness, so to speak, but not crossing that threshold where you're getting a lot of lactic acid and your form's breaking down and you're really in the hurt locker. It's more of an 80% effort. And so maybe you have that on Thursday. Maybe it's more substantial, though. Maybe the next week on that Thursday, uh, you have a lighter track session on Tuesday, but then on Thursday we hit it hard with some more volume or some more miles or kilometers at lactate threshold, and we're doing a session of two mile repeats, right? With it's four times two miles or four times thirty two hundred meters. It could be four times three k. That's that's one point eight miles, but uh, it's a it's a big session, and you're doing that around faster than your half marathon pace on a flat road. Uh, I mean, a little slightly slower than ten k pace work. So. The idea is we're getting in a full mix of, of the spectrum of, of different intensity over the course of a seven-day period, over the course of a week, and we're working on our endurance. We're working uh, the aerobic system really hard with VO2 max repeats. We're working the leg muscles really hard with doing some speed work on a track or maybe they're, they're hill repeats, short hill repeats, high-intensity work, and then we're, we're doing some moderate-intensity work for, for longer durations. And that's kind of the basic recipe for uh, periodized training, doing these, these variety of workouts in this different spectrum uh, to, to increase your lung power, your, your aerobic power, uh, how, how well you're developing more mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, developing more blood flow to the muscles, more efficient blood flow to the muscles, working on tendon and muscle strength, actually creating power in the stride. And, and resistance to fatigue, so to speak, uh, being able to, to keep running at a fast, steady pace, even at a, a long duration, uh, long distance, but also working on that mental strength, working on, on aerobic metabolism, fat burning capacity, glycogen sparing, and then also working uh, on just heart and lung efficiency, basically, and really working on getting used to what it's going to be like in in the later stages of a race whether it's a shorter race or a long ultra race it's going to be hard uh the shorter races you just have to run faster and so there's a higher intensity works the system a little bit differently whereas uh, a longer ultra marathon obviously there's a lot of skeletal muscular fatigue your your quads could blow out on a downhill but they also kind of blow out on an uphill because you get really tired and uh, you could have fueling issues, massive dehydration, bonking uh, from glycogen depletion, having stomach issues and, and things like that. But the idea of, of training is to callous our bodies and to prepare our bodies for these these feats of endurance and these uh, really hard distance races. And all distance races are hard. And so it doesn't go into shock, basically, because you kind of do go into shock when you're, you say, OK, I'm going to run 100 miles now. Uh, the, the body's not used to that. But if you've done some some 20, maybe 30 mile long runs or what is that, 32K to, to 50K types of long runs, then, you know, your body's going to 
not be totally in, in denial, hopefully, with, with what you're doing. It's it's going to be hard in the, the second half of the race for sure. But uh, if you've been able to train more consistently and you've put in consistent high mileage and you've put in a variety of workouts, which periodization kind of ensures, then uh, hopefully you could get closer to maximizing your potential. And that's really the whole idea behind it. And back to the, the seven-day cycle or seven-day spectrum, we have all these key workouts. Uh, we could you know pick and choose Oh, I'm going to do a speed workout here. I'm going to do a, a long run here. I'm going to do uh, a tempo run or lactate threshold run or st- a steady state here. We have all these workouts we could choose from. And, you know, if I'm thinking to road marathon training, it's like, okay, I got my, I got my two by five mile or two by eight K bread and butter workout. I'll do that three weeks out. I got my uh, 10 mile up tempo run negative split or 16 K progression run where I start slower than marathon pace in the first half. And then I hit closer to marathon pace in the second half. I got my, my 22 mile long run negative split long run or 35 K long run where I, I do a eight times three minutes hard, two minutes easy fartlek. Uh, I'm using the term fartlek very loosely here. I know it's unstructured usually, but we do it by timed, more timed intervals of running three minutes at 10k pace and then two minutes easy at the end of this this long run. You know, I know I want to do that, and when do I want to do that? Maybe I want to do that for six weeks out from my race because these adaptations take a while to kick in, right? You don't just do a really hard track session five days before uh, your key race and expect it to give you big benefits when in reality it's probably going to tire you out a lot more right you got to give yourself 10 days or you know for a vo2 max workout to kick in you got to give yourself a couple weeks for for a long run to kick in and it might make you tired initially but then you dial things back and you taper for a week or two before your race and then uh, you super compensate or your, your legs are a little bit more fresh and you kind of realize the gains of that fitness but Part of the aspect of periodization is having a higher weekly mileage total and building your weekly mileage up. So at the start of a a training cycle, the start of a training plan, like I said, we we usually advocate having some really low mileage weeks, easy, relaxed running weeks. And we say easy, relaxed, we're talking about conversational pace, right? Hammer that home. You could talk and carry on a conversation and be nice and relaxed while you're running Some people, you get too caught up in the heart rate, but it's a relatively low heart rate, right? You want to be probably under 75% max heart rate. If you know what your max heart rate is, most people don't know what their true 100% value is. So we're talking about easy conversational pace, relaxed pace running, just to get the the, the muscles uh, going, get them firing, try to practice with good running form. It's harder at slower speeds, but uh, just getting that pounding in the legs so that you're not when you jump your mileage up and you start doing speed workouts and, and faster stuff, you don't get injured. Uh, and it's, it's, there's no guarantees. It's a tough demanding sport. You're trying to always avoid injury, skeletal muscular injury. We're talking about impact force types of injury just from jumping up our mileage, right? Running on, on, with bad form on, on hard surfaces with flimsy shoes could really do you in. Uh, we're not just talking about getting a ankle sprain on the trail that could happen at any time as well but talking about actually getting like impact force stress fractures plantar fasciitis achilles tendonitis basically any repetitive strain (laughs) tendonitis in uh, any part of your body uh, from running Uh, you want to slowly introduce things get things stronger get the tendon strength muscle strength up before you start really hammering the workouts before you start speed so you got to start slow you got to build your mileage up maybe that takes a month, maybe it takes four, five, six weeks. Uh, in our training plans, you off, you often don't hit your peak mileage until uh, almost the end of the plan, <laughs> eight, nine weeks, ten weeks in. Uh, so you're building, 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 and the weekly mileage is going up. So that's one stress. And if it, they were all just easy miles and all conversational, it'd be pretty easy, right? You're just slowly building that weekly mileage up. Maybe start at at thirty miles a week, fifty k a week. And the next week you're bumping up another 8K or five miles. So then you're at you know 35 miles a week. And then the next week it goes up another five miles to 40 miles a week, 8K a week. But then it stays there at 40 miles a week for a week. And then you bump up 10K or six miles the next week to 46 miles. And it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, but at a certain point, it's your body's adapting and hopefully you're getting better and stronger and you're not injured. Uh, we'll say, okay, we're going we're gonna to sprinkle in some quality sessions here. We're going to start off with a 20-minute tempo run. 
Uh, and we're going to work on some of that speed faster than half marathon race pace or 85% max heart rate for 20 minutes. See how you see how you deal with that. And you start throwing in some speed, you start extending, uh, you know, you're not running 10 miles every day, you're not running 16k every day, right? You're not running, maybe you're doing less than that, I guess, if your weekly mileage is, is less than 50 miles a week. So you're doing you're not doing 8k or 10k every day, you're not doing five or six miles every single day, maybe a lot of days you are. But then on the weekend, maybe you have a longer run, and maybe it starts at 12 miles or 20k. And uh, it's just, a, you know, a Saturday is a longer day or Sunday is a longer day compared to the other days. And so your mileage totals are jumping around. So that's one variable that's changing your, your daily mileage total, how much you're running each day. And maybe you start off only running four or five days a week, but now you're up to running six days a week and uh, taking one day a week off. Maybe eventually you have to run seven days a week. Uh, and if you're on a really high mileage advanced programs, maybe you're running seven days a week and you're, some days you're running twice a day. Uh, so it, it gets more complex. The, the stress, though, of the mileage keeps adding up, and that's one stress. And that's one change of, of periodization that we see is just increasing your mileage. And we found with a lot of people you you start to really benefit in terms of aerobic benefits and, and muscular strength and stamina, uh, especially when you get over that kind of 50 mile a week, 80K a week type of average. If you start putting in weeks and weeks and weeks at that kind of volume and higher and you haven't before in your life, then you, you start to get some really big gains. Whereas if you're always stuck at, at 30 miles a week or 50K a week, uh, you're probably not realizing your full potential, especially if you're training for like a marathon or something. Generally, if you could bump that up just a little bit and be consistent with higher mileage, higher volume training and not get hurt, then uh, you're going to realize more aerobic benefits and you're going to get a lot more fit. And I found that out a long time ago when I was running track in high school. I started off with, you know, pretty low mileage, 20, 30 miles a week. Of course, we were racing the 1500 meters in the mile and two mile and 5k in cross country. Uh, I got to adjust my camera here real quick. I'll take a pause. All right. Sorry. Sorry for that pause. Still uh, working out technical difficulties and hopefully there's not too much background noise, but we'll sum this up. So the one variable is, is your weekly mileage and, and how that changes and fluctuates. And over the course of a year or a season, you, you have ebbs and flows and that's periodization. Uh, you know, you, you do a race, you take some weeks off, recover, slowly build back up. Then you hit peak weekly mileage, maybe eight weeks in or, or 10 weeks in or a couple months in, maybe you hit your highest mileage totals ever in your life uh, during a training cycle and you get really, really fit. But of course, the other aspect with periodization and getting fit is the timing of these quality workouts or specialized sessions that you do over time, over a training block, over four to eight weeks or over a, a 12 week or 16 week schedule or cycle. And part of that's changing up your long run, not always doing the same sort of long run, adding in intensity like track workouts or hill repeats, some shorter high intensity stuff, adding in the, the lactate threshold or the tempo run extended longer workouts. Uh, maybe it's, it's, five miles 8k in volume or it's it's 16k or 20k in volume 12 10 to 12 miles in volume uh like two mile repeats even 5k repeats uh these different types of sessions and how they all kind of mix together and that's really the beauty of of a really magical that's that's the magic i should say of a, a training plan is not just picking and choosing workouts randomly, spinning the wheel and saying, oh, I think I'll do some speed, I'll do a long run, I'll do this, 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 and this. It's looking at the schedule as a whole cycle and say, hey, you did this last week. What did you do two weeks ago? What are you going to have to do in two weeks? When is your race? And and the timing, the timing is key. And the flow of the workouts and how you respond to them in a progressive manner is key. And that's really the, the big takeaway uh, with with what we try to put into our training plans, but also what we want to empower you here with when we talk about periodization. And so that's kind of just a brief intro. Again, be sure to subscribe on here on iTunes as well as check out our uh, training website, sagejourning.com, also on the YouTube channel, VO2Max Productions. You can follow me on social media, at Sage Canada. Uh, again, I'm a coach and professional mountain ultra trail runner. It's done a lot of marathons over the years. And uh, thank you so much to all the Patreon supporters, again, for really making this possible, motivating me, inspiring me to get back into podcasting. I do want to do more of these and have guests on the show. Really, thanks uh, for your support. Hope your running's going well. Shout out to my title sponsor, Hoka11. 
or Hoka One One, I should say. Uh, that's how we pronounce it now. Uh, it's the original name, brand name. Uh, thank you guys. Hope your running's going well. Stay tuned for more. Running down a dream.